All right, shalom, shalom, Shabbat shalom, everyone. This is Brother D with DevotedTI.com. Uh, we're here on another Shabbat, and uh, we're continuing going through the scriptures, a little devotional group study uh, of the scriptures, and we're in Deuteronomy chapter 21 right now. <clears throat> I'll start off the reading for today. And I'm reading from the scriptures, 1998, or the scriptures, 2009. And it reads, When anyone is found slain, lying in the field, in the land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you to possess, and it is not known who struck him, then your elders and your judges shall go out, and they shall measure the distance from the slain man to the cities round about. And it shall be that the elders of the city nearest to the slain man shall take a heifer which has not been worked and which has not pulled with a yoke. <clears throat> and the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a wadi with flowing water, which is neither, neither plowed nor sown. And they shall break the heifer's neck there in the wadi and just for educational purposes wadi is valley verse 5 and the priest the sons of the levite shall come near for yahuwah your elohim has chosen them to serve him and to be blessed and to bless in the name of yahuwah and by their mouth, every strife and every stroke is tried. And let all the elders of that city nearest to the slain man wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, nor have our eyes seen it. O Yahuwah, forgive your people, Yisrael, whom you have ransomed, and do not allow innocent blood in the midst of your people, Yisrael, and the blood guilt shall be pardoned to them. And we all know that Yahusha shed his blood, and his blood uh, is fulfills and has covered uh, more and cleanses more than any of the other sacrifices and offerings that has been done in the past under the previous covenant, the first covenant. And the blood guilt shall be pardoned to them. Thus you purge the guilt of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the eyes of Yahuwah. When you go out to fight, you want to share something? Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, we could share verses 1 to 9. Uh, for those who just joined in, um, we have a number, last numbers, 1044. If you could just please announce real quickly, just announce your name so I can put you in our in our record. Yeah, hey, it's David. All right, Brother David, thank you. Um, I'm using my computer for the first time, so I guess it's not saving some of the numbers, but I'm going to put you in right now. David. Shalom, Brother David. Glad you could join us today. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 21. And by the way, David, I appreciated you and Doug's uh, time on the study. I was listening to it this morning. I am almost ready to uh, put it up on YouTube. So we're in Deuteronomy 21. We just read verses 1 to 9, and my wife wants to share a word about it so far. I think what's interesting in this part was... um. What is it? In verse 5, it says, And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near. For them, Yahuwah Elohecha has chosen to minister unto him and to bless in the name of Yahuwah. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be, um, in some verses say, be tried. And this is, this is just brought up my, when we were on the conference call, what, probably two weeks ago now, just talking about, um, in regards to stoning or, or killing the unrighteous. But I think it is supposed to be that the Levites are here. And I know that you have brought up, well, Phinehas, 
had wind up striking um, the Israelite and I believe it was a Midian woman or a Moabite woman. I, forget, I think it was Midian. Um, but Phinehas was the son of a priest. So I'm wondering if it was basically executed by a Levite, that that was okay. I, I just think something with the, the Levites and judgment and their judgment um, and their teaching of the Torah makes a lot more of the standpoints of how we can execute the judgment of Israel over the land. Um, but that was just a, a something that jumped out at me in the chapter. Very good. So you're saying that um, the judicial governmental uh, how do you say it? Um, what do you say in court when you a final judgment, a verdict? The verdicts are to be declared by priests. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I totally understand that. Totally understand that. And oh yeah, I know he was a Levite for sure. I just didn't see a. I didn't. I didn't. Right. Um. So he was a priest. So yeah, we would have to see if he was literally a Levite. Okay, Phineas. Okay. Okay, I found it. It's in Numbers twenty-five seven, and it says, "And when this one say Pinehas, the son of Elisar, the son of Aharon the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the assembly and took the javelin." So I think just the Levites in it of themselves. I could be wrong, but I think the Levites are the ones that kind of execute more of the the Torah. Um, from Moses to Aharon, all the way down, they were the Levites kind of just had a special um, possession of the Torah for you, for Yisrael. Excuse me. Um, what is the scripture about the tribe of Yehuda? The sephir shall never depart. Aren't they? Aren't they also play a role in judgment? Judges. I'm not sure. Anyway, think about that question. Think about that question. But so, okay. So here's my thing about Phineas. The situation with Phineas when he when he when he drove a spear through uh, a pagan Gentile uh, woman and an Israelite man, because I think that's what it was. An Israelite man took on a, a, a Midianite woman, and Phineas, in his jealous, righteous anger, came in and drove a spear into both of them, and Yahu was actually pleased with that. Um, I didn't see a, I didn't see a trial for that. It was like the man just came in and drove a spear in. So that's just an observation. My wife has raising her hand again. Here we go. I think the reason there wasn't a trial was because it says by every two witnesses, you need two witnesses to see something, and that act was done in public. There was no, no need to question what was going on, basically. Beauty. Sounds good to me. A menorah, golden menorah for Millie. Miracles. Very good, very good. So, needing two or three witnesses. All right. That's something to, to throw around. Can a, can, a, can, a, can a normal Israelite citizen who is not a Levite or a priest, can he execute judgment? Can he stone? You know, or do you need the Levites? Do you need the priests? Do you need the courtroom officials? Do you need that whole protocol? That's kind of the question we've been throwing around. Those of us, you know, we're all learning this whole Torah. We're trying to see how to apply this this Torah life uh, today, um, knowing that we don't have a Levitical priest, we don't have a temple, we're not in our own land, and people say we're picking and choosing which laws to 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 follow. Uh, Duh, <laughs> we have no choice. If Yahuwah says certain people need to be in place in order for us to obey certain commandments, then we obviously can't follow through with that commandment. That's not my picking and choosing. That's just the divine protocol of what Yahuwah has established already. And it's and it's been done throughout the Tanakh, the, 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 the prophets. Uh, we see when they were in exile, they were, we saw a lot of lack of following certain commandments. And... Anyway, that's the questions we're throwing up in the air as we're reading along. So, we're good? Continue? All right, so we left off at verse 9. That was good. A good little break there. And, oh, Doug has a question. 
Let me let Doug in. I found the verse you're looking for. My man. Genesis 49, verse 10. And in the Septuagint, it's interesting. It says, and um, let's see. Hold on. So I have to go back from Deuteronomy. All right. So hold on a sec. I, I did find it at Genesis 49, verse 10. A ruler shall not fail from Yehuda, nor a prince from his loins, until there come the things stored up for him. And he is the expectation of nations. I think that's talking about Yahusha. Yeah. And uh, Septuagint says, um, let me read with you. Septuagint says, until there comes the thing stored up for him, and yep. the Masoretic has until Shiloh comes. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I don't know. We we would have to really see if Shiloh's actually there, uh, whether whether that's actually in there or not. I, for, according to I forget. According to Concordance H seven eight eight six, it's Shiloh, and it says, "He whose it is that which belongs to him." Tranquility meaning uncertain. Meaning is uncertain. <laughs> So it kind of is, I guess it's the same Wonderful. thing, it's saying the same exact thing. It's just that uh, yeah. they're breaking it down as a as a name in these translations. Yeah. Uh, let me look real quick, and then we can move on. Um, the Hebrew, the Masoretic. Let me look at the Masoretic real quick. And it says, Kashilo. Kush, so it does say Shilo in there. <laughs> That's the word. Uh, it's definitely a word that's there. So, oh, it's actually there twice. Mm. Interesting. For Shiloh. Interesting. So, anyways, yep, I think it's talking about Yahusha as well, and he's gonna be the king. King, king, uh, kings were only supposed to be from the tribe of Yehuda, correct? Yep. Um, and I believe Yehuda is supposed to be the lawgiver. I believe. Um, I believe Yehua chose them to to be the ones that would teach his law. Actually, from, from the line of David, though, from the line of David. Yeah. Um, pretty sure. Yeah. Um, even though there was kings from the house of Yashrael in Scripture. So I don't know whether that was Yahuwah's will or not, or how how that um how that pertains to the Torah. Because there there were some kings from Yehuda, some kings from the house of Yashrael, so it was kind of split. Yeah, there are many kings from different tribes throughout the throughout the Israel's time in the land. But I'm just thinking from from this point forward. I guess after after. Solomon and all that. I guess the expectation is for a king to come from the line of Judah, Yehuda. Yeah. Yeah. Yehusha is the expectation of the nations because he's the one that brings, um, you know, the goyim in. So he would be the expectation. The this up and not to get off on a tangent. I mean, the whole point we're we're trying to we're trying to talk about judgment, executing judgment, verdicts. Uh, Murder, uh, not murder, um, you know, to, to do the death penalty and all that stuff. But I don't want to get off on a tangent, brother. I just want to stay focused. So. I'm sorry. It's all good. My, I just want to make it clear that I'm, I'm, as we're reading, we're trying to see if how is judgment executed. Is it executed by a random citizen can just pick up a stone and kill someone? Uh, is it sufficient that there's two or three witnesses and they're a regular citizen and they can do it? Or do they need the authority of the Levitical priest? Um, is a is a is a Yahudin sufficient or does it need to be a Levite or a priest, you know, who's dwelling in whatever hmm. part of Israel? So well, just, again, just well, you who is us himself two or three witnesses? So Yehu himself, when he's getting the Torah, says he must establish the matter by two or three witnesses. So 
Um, we can't just stone people randomly. Right. And my I, question I is, think, two or three witnesses, think, is it sufficient to have a normal citizen, not necessarily a person who's a judicial leader like a, a priest or a Levite? That's my question. Huh. All right. Uh, David, David wants know. to get in. Thank you. Well, I just want to make a quick comment. You know, Melchizedek was both priest and king, and he was not in the Levitical line. So a lot of people think, well, the Messiah is not really a priest according to the Levitical priesthood, but Yah promised him he was a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, who was both king and priest. So that's all I wanted to say. That's a good comment, brother. Thank you for sharing. I think that's legitimate. Um, so as a Melchizedek, as a Melchizedek, a king and a priest, he will be able to execute the judgments of the Torah. And amen to that. But I'm just questioning right now, like, how do we execute these judgments now? We're living in America, right? We're living outside of our land. We're not in the promised land. We don't have a king, uh, you know, a Torah observant king. And a lot of these laws that talk about stoning because the battle becomes, oh, you know what? The Messiah came to do away with stoning. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. Uh, he never said those words. Uh, there's only one time where he had an opportunity to stone a woman and he didn't stone her. And he doesn't really say why. All he says is he who is without sin cast the first stone. But what we can observe from that situation is that both a man and a woman should be getting stoned when caught in adultery. And only the woman was caught in that situation, which is an unjust situation according to the Torah. It was an unrighteous act. In my opinion, it, it seems unfitting to stone that woman if it's not being done the right way. So I don't. I don't see that it's also here's another thing just to be fair they were also in the promised land they were in um Yerushalayim they were in the land so I don't know if that plays a role why why stoning was still in effect so is stoning not in effect because we're not in our own land and we don't have our own judicial system or is it still in effect as long as we have two or three witnesses and we're going to get locked up if since we're not in our own land cuz what we're doing is going to be illegal <laughs> so those are just things we're throwing up in the air, but you have anything you want to say, wife? All right, let's continue. That's what we do here. We discuss. If you don't like it, change the channel. <laughs> All right, where were we? Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 10. And I'm reading from Scriptures 1998. All right, it says, when you... Go out to fight against your enemies, and you who your Elohim shall give them into your hand, and you shall take them captive, and shall see among the captives a woman fair of form, and shall delight in her, and take her for your wife. Then you shall bring her home to your house, and she shall shave her head, and trim her nails. Wow. And put aside the mantle of her captivity and shall dwell in your house, and mourn her father and her mother a month of days. And after that, you shall go in to her, and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. It shall be, if you are not pleased with her, then you shall let her go at her desire. But you do not sell her at all for silver. Do not treat her harshly, since you have humbled her. I think we can talk about that right there. We'll pause right there. Talk about that. I think continue to talk about marriage in the next verses, but we'll talk about this for a little bit, guys. <coughs> Excuse me. If anybody wants to jump in, let's see here. My thoughts. My thoughts here is uh, this is most likely context talking about when they're going into the promised land to take over uh, the heathen lands, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is what's going on here. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little confusing because you hear from the Torah not to take on these wives. 
you know, that they'll seduce you to follow other Elohim. But here we're seeing a commandment that you can actually go in and take them captive and shall see among the captives a woman fair of form and shall delight in her and take her for your wife. So, all right, Brother Doug, I'm going to let you jump in. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a problem with that too, bro. Uh, because in the New Testament, um, Shaul speaks a lot on not being unequally yoked uh, with unbelievers. And technically, if we take a wife from another nation, most likely she doesn't serve Yahuwah. Most likely she's not a believer. And technically we're une unequally yoking ourselves in marriage. So I, I just wonder how... How is that not contradictory? Right. And that's just being honest. We're reading and just we're just honestly interpreting here. Um at the same time, let me let me just throw this in there. I'm gonna throw a curveball in there. If there wasn't any mixing, how how would it be possible that Gentiles would be able to um let me say this. Let me think about this a little bit more before I say it clearly. So men are going and getting Gentile women. I believe that the seed is followed through the man. So if a man is an Israelite and a woman is a Gentile, that child is a physical Israelite. That's what I believe. And, you know, I know that there's debates on that. Um, but how would, how would the promise of Yisrael the physical Yisrael becoming a multitude of nations and as numerous as the stars in the sand of the sea if they weren't able to mix somewhat. And we know that there was a lot of mixing all throughout Scripture. From, from this point forward, we see all throughout the Tanakh, there's a whole lot of mixing going on. And um, in Acts chapter 16... Acts chapter 16, it says, And he came to Deborah, Lustra, and see a certain taught one was there named Timotheus, Timothy, the son of a certain Yahudi woman who believed, but his father was Greek, who was well spoken of by the brothers who were at Lustra. And yeah, he's a Greek. I believe this guy's a Gentile. Hmm. He got circumcised at the same time. A lot of people think that he was a, a Yahudin, but I don't believe that. Anyways, those are my little yeah. thoughts about that so far. If anybody wants to jump in, Brother Doug. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, to an extent, yeah, that's true. I guess, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to be grafted in, um, you know, but my my thinking process is there there has to be some type of context we're missing here. Like, you know, are they allowed to just take whatever woman there is, like among the nations that they take over? Like, I don't know. It right. just it I'm seems really it, it just seems very general. I don't know. And we'll find out, you know, as we're reading more and learning more. But, you know, just as off the, per off the bat, right, it kind of strikes us as kind of odd, right? And that's yeah, very the odd. whole point of why we're reading. We're reading like this is we're just trying to be honest and genuine to the text. So, all right, let's keep moving on here. And it keeps talking about it. It says, you shall bring her home to your house and shall shave her head and trim her nails. That's very humbling and humiliating. I think that's part of why he says after you have humbled her. I think that's part of it, not the whole reason. But so he shaves her head and trims her nails. Put aside the mantle. Put aside the mantle of her captivity. That's an interesting phrase there. I don't really know what that means. If anybody wants to look that up and dig into that, we can come back to that next time or after our break. But that's a phrase I would like to dig into. And shall dwell in her house, uh, dwell in your house, not her house, and mourn her father and mother, 
a month of days. And after that, you shall go into her. So there's sexual intercourse. And be her husband. And she shall be your wife. That's a topic right there we've brought up before. Not in these uh, fellowship studies, but, you know, when you enter a woman or, or uh, when you enter a woman or you let a man enter you, does that make you husband and wife or is it, can it just be fornication? And I think there's other scriptures we can debate with that where uh, if a man was to uh, violate a woman, then there's a choice to become a marriage or not from that point forward. So it's probably not considered just because I remember um, when I was first out of the Christian church, Philip Ness Thomas was kind of preaching that a little bit, that if you enter a woman, that that becomes your your wife or whatever. Anyways. So they become husband and wife. And it shall be if you are not pleased with her. Here goes another just, just some very uncomfortable verses. I'm not going to lie. Very uncomfortable. If you are not pleased with her, what, what, what would make somebody not pleased with a wife? And I bet you there's a whole bunch of stuff in the Talmud regarding this. She don't know how to cook right. She don't clean right. Then you shall let her go at her desire. That is a very, very tough passage right there. But you do not sell her at all for silver. And again, this is not an Israelite woman. This is a Gentile woman. So that's another thing to consider. Do not treat her harshly since you have humbled her. Okay. This is what we're reading. At the same time, let's see, verse 1 of Deuteronomy 21 says, When anyone is found slain lying in the field, Yahuwah your Elohim has given you to possess. It almost sounds like, does this, if I'm not mistaken, I'm throwing this in here, guys. Is this a thus saith Yahuwah? Or is this thus saith Moses? If anybody wants to dig that up real quick. But from verse 1, it kind of sounds like, I don't really hear, like, thus saith Yahuwah, you know, or Yahuwah said unto Moses, tell the children of Israel, right? I, I don't know. Maybe that's something to consider right now. But my wife is going to the previous chapter. She's digging in. So, all right. I'm sorry, guys, but this is the way that I like to read. I like to ask questions. I like to believe there's nothing... There's no such thing as a stupid question. Brother Doug. Well, according to the Subtusion, it's not saying thus says Yahuwah. So if I was to interpret verse 1 literally, I've, I'm thinking Moses is the one saying this. Yeah, I'm Because, <laughs> I mean... I can check right now in the restored name King James and see if it says thus says Yahuwah, but it's saying the same exact thing. And that kind of would make sense when Yahusha answers the question when they ask, why did Moses give a certificate of divorce? And Yahusha answers, he gave it because of the hardness of your heart, but since the beginning it has not been this way. It's almost like that was not that was not Yahuwah's intention. That was not Yahuwah's will, almost like. That's kind of like what he was saying, in my yeah. opinion. So um, it could be Moses was pulling like a Paul, or Paul was pulling a Moses when Paul is giving his own advice versus giving advice straight from the Ruach, from the, from the Spirit. There is a difference. Yeah, I mean, um, and where you, I just wanted to add, too, about the whole, um, if you find no favor in your wife or your wife does something that a man you know, that his man doesn't find favor in his wife anymore. I think in context, that's talking about adultery. I would like to believe I don't, so as well. I would like to believe so as well. Uh, but it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to see that with the lack of, of scripture around there. I'm going to let David get in, Doug, if you don't have anything else to share. Okay. All right. Well, 
I just wanted to make a point real quick. A lot of what's in Deuteronomy is Moses speaking. So I do I do see what you were saying, though, D, when you were referring to Paul and how he speaks sometimes personally versus to the Ruach. But I do believe ultimately, though, the, uh, everything of what is being taught is from Yah in some way or another. Do you know what I mean? Like ultimately, that's it, the focus should not be lost. That that's what it's all about, you know. But I believe ultimately, you know, just like how Yahushua came from Yah, I believe, you know, Moses sent Yah. I mean, Yah sent Moses, excuse me, sorry. But ultimately, I believe it was all through the Ruach, even in Deuteronomy, through everything. Yeah. And that's I, all I, I like wanted to, to say. I'd like to believe that too. It's just I find it, I find it almost seems contradicting to what was spoken from the mouth of Yahuwah regarding uh, relations with foreign women and marriage. It almost seems, I'm just trying to find some consistency, some harmony, or trying to harmonize it and trying to make sense of it. And right now, I'm just being honest and saying I don't know what to make of this passage. Well, in a way, I look at, at it sometimes as a way of provision, you know, meaning as time progresses, you know, when things maybe start to change. I don't know, maybe I think that the Father can make provisions and has made provisions for things, you know, because it's like with polygamy, you know, Yah didn't create man and woman to be multiple. He created it to be one man and one woman, but he made provision for it to be one man with multiple women. But I don't think that people should rush out and go and get into a multi-partner marriage, you know. But ultimately, the point is for one man and one woman, and the thing is, I don't think that the man has to take that woman. You know, he has a choice to take that woman, you know. So ultimately, he can just stay away from all this if he just doesn't even bother with that, you know. Yeah, there there is an option. This is not a commandment for sure, 100%. Yeah. I and that, that's really for the better because unless that woman is really seeking to be in a relationship with the Most High, then – you're just going to be battling with her because if she's of the world and you're not, then that's conflicting. And when you're in a, a really close personal relationship like that, especially a man and a woman, it's going to be very hard to really work together because you have two spirits that are opposing each other. So I think it's a very risky thing in a way. And that's why I think they have to shave the head and trim the nails, you know, and show her this is serious, you know, yeah. And it says, you know, if if you find something in her that you don't like, you know, mm-hmm. because that's the risk that you take bringing in someone like that. So um, yeah. I would say ultimately just like, like Paul, you know, Paul was not against marriage, but Paul spoke a lot about staying single and being and abstaining. So, yeah, and I, I think mean, that's the, woman, the concept the we do see come, in the Tanakh. The, the woman could come with a lot of unclean spirits. Right, she's right. carrying a whole lot of unclean spirits from worshiping other deities, and uh, you know, with that comes all types of stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, for I guess worldly terms, terminology, bipolar yeah. disorder, schizophrenia, <laughs> um, Tourette, uh, Tourette, insomnia. <laughs> I mean, all types of stuff. Those are all worldly terms that are not in scripture, but I think those are all. Uh, oh yeah, spiritual and mental uh, disabilities that that are definitely rooted in in many times and many things a lot deeper than just physical things. So anyways, I don't know. Yeah, it might be talking about stuff like that. Maybe this woman is, is super contentious. She has an evil spirit in her or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I have no idea because the text doesn't really go further into it. So. All right, it's I just two thoughts. Because anytime I get the scriptures about women, I kind of just like jump or cringe sometimes. Um, I do have the same confusion as to why this would be allowed to go with uh, foreign women. Um, one side I was kind of just summing through essentially says that it's, it's a little different from what Deuteronomy is struck in the sense of um, with these women, they were to be virgin women. Um, like when, when Israel will go into these captive land and they would completely demolish land, the only things that would be there would either be children or women. Um, 
essentially. So they they should have or would have destroyed their idols. They would have destroyed their their mighty one. Um, and this month is almost like a purification and a mourning in a sense because she has her she can't go back to her family because she has none if they're destroyed. Um, she shouldn't be able to go back to her mighty ones because they should have been destroyed. Um, so that was just kind of kind of interesting. But with the point in regards to whether or not this is the safe Yahua, um, if I had to be frank, I think it's kind of I guess it's a dangerous question just because a lot in Deuteronomy. I mean, there there's commands in Deuteronomy that aren't surrounded with just the safe Yahua. Our mindset is, does this chapter begin with it? But they didn't divide the scriptures with chapters. So even if it's not in verse 1 that says Yahuwah, it doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't at the very beginning of Deuteronomy. I do believe that all this is laid out from Yahuwah. Um, if not, he would have said something because Moshe was a prophet of Yahuwah. And if there's any prophet that, even Moshe himself says, any prophet that says turn to another one or, or anything like that, then they need to be destroyed. So, um, yeah, I think just looking for just to thus say Yahuwah, but before and after every command, I don't think we're going to find it. I think it kind of is, in some context, a given. Um, but I understand the question in regards to why would they take on foreign women at the same time. So those are just some of my thoughts. Yep. Uh, I lean on the side of this is definitely coming from Yahuwah through Moses. Um, it's just I'm just being 100% honest with myself as I'm reading. So that's all. Just want to throw some questions out there. And uh, anyway, with that being said, let us continue. Today's study might just be on this chapter. It's taking so long going through it. It's just hitting our heart, hitting our conscience so hard. All right. Let's see here. This side. Da, da, da. She'll be uh, pleased with her. Okay. Verse 15. Here we go again. Another distinct issue here. When a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved, and the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then it shall be. On the day he makes his sons to inherit his possessions, see that's a concept we kind of don't really have. I, I can't relate with that. Um, you know, I didn't really have any anything to inherit from my physical parents but usually the cool thing would be that you have some something to give to your children so that they can inherit whether it's a house or you know some life savings or something uh, money for college whatever it might be he is not allowed to treat the son of the beloved wife as firstborn in the face of the son of the unloved who is truly the firstborn so in in the kid who is uh, unloved the father is not allowed to treat the loved son as the firstborn in the face of the unloved son who is really the firstborn and that kind of makes sense with um, I mean we can go all day Jacob and Esau you know, Esau took the birthright, but the the firstborn son wasn't really around. And I know this is a little different because it's not a son, uh, a different wife or whatever like that. Actually, they were. Yeah, but firstborn from same wife, same wife. So this is different. So this is different, uh, slightly different. This is a distinct situation, but it's kind of I'm just bringing that situation in because it wasn't done in their in their faces. You know, it wasn't done in Esau's face. Like Esau wasn't in the room with Jacob as he took his birthright. He was kind of away. Well, that's another point. Yeah, the, the father was blind too. But I'm just saying. I mean, I'm I'm kind of bringing that in because it kind of it kind of connects. All right. Anyways, verse 17. But he is to acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion. But he is to acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has for he is the beginning of his strength and the right of the firstborn is his powerful words when a man has a wayward and rebellious son who is not listening to the voice 
Sorry, I just I was looking at some stuff from the previous verses. Uh, when a man has a wayward and rebellious son who is not listening to the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have disciplined him, does not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city. The elders of the city. You see that? To the gate of his city. And shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is wayward and rebellious. He is not listening to our voice. He is a gluten and a drunkard. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old could be a drunkard. <laughs> so, at the same time, from what I've heard culturally, kids were allowed to do certain things at a younger age because there was more maturity back in the day, or something like that. I'm not sure, but I know nowadays the drinking age is like 21. But kids are drinking at an earlier age than that. They're drinking in their teens. So these are definitely not adolescents. Let's just say that. I wouldn't even want to say preteens. These have to be like teenagers at least. 21. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. Thus you shall purge the evil from your midst and let all Israel hear and fear. And when a man has committed a sin worthy of death, then he shall be put to death, and you shall hang him on a tree. Let his body not remain overnight on the tree, for you shall certainly bury him the same day. For he who has hanged is the curse of Elohim, and that applies to our Messiah. He was hung on a tree. So that you do not defile the land which Yahuwah your Elohim has given you as an inheritance. All right. So a lot of stuff in there. Uh, if anybody wants to jump in, uh, got some stuff in there with discipline and children, um, inheritances, okay, for the firstborn, and, yeah, the hanging on the tree. Brother Doug, go ahead. Yeah, man, that verse jumped off at me because um, it's interesting. Um, he who hangs on a tree is a curse of Yahuwah. Well, then Yahushua become a curse for us? Yes, sir. I'm just saying. <laughs> yes, I'm just saying maybe, maybe he was hung on a tree. Yeah. Uh, you know? John, uh, let's see. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. Uh, yeah, the Elohim of our fathers raised up Yahushua, whom you slew, and hanged on a tree. That's the restored name, King James. And I believe Galatians even says it too. Um, ten thirty nine, Acts ten thirty nine says, and we are witnesses of all he did both in the country of Yahudim and in Yerushalayim, who they even killed by hanging on a tree or timber. We also got Acts ten thirty nine. Yeah, keep. <clears throat> Yeah, King James does, literally says tree. Yep. Let's see. First Peter two twenty four says, "Who himself bore our sins in his body on the on the timber or the tree, so that we, having died to sins, might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed." So I know there's another one. It says he became a curse for us. Yeah, Galatians is the one I'm thinking of. Um, I forget if it's Galatians four or. Um. Whoever gets it gets a menorah. I'm looking for it. I know it's somewhere in chapter four. Uh, uh, just, 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 just. I'm gonna give it to you. I found it. Galatians three thirteen. You get the gold. Uh, 
you get it. You get the credit. It says, <laughs> Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah. Okay, you see that, guys? From the curse of the Torah. He didn't redeem us from the Torah. He didn't redeem <laughs> us from the law of Moses. He redeemed us from the curse. Okay, for not By how? the law of Moses. By how? How did it become a curse for us? For it has been written, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Bam. Perfect. Wow. So actually, Yahushua literally, literally was executed according to the, to the Torah. So was that part of what the Messiah had to do? Was to be hung on the tree to be fulfilling the law? I don't know. Let me let me let my wife get in on this. I think that's a very interesting question. Um, and I almost kind of want to say yes too, because we in and of ourselves are the ones worthy of death. Um, literally, that if a man committed sin worthy of death, and and I think all of us have fallen from the righteousness of the Most High and are deserving of that death, and yet he took it for us. He, he literally took our penalty, and I think that was in one of our penalties, which is to be hung on a tree. Um, so I think it's also in that sense. Yeah, I guess that's one way for him to be cursed without disobeying the Torah. <laughs> right? I guess that's a way. I guess yeah. Yahuwah made provision like David made a way uh, for... Um, our Messiah to become a curse without breaking the Torah. I don't know if that makes sense, but he made he made a way for him to be perfect and sinless, but at the same time still be cursed when we deserve to be cursed for breaking the Torah. So he was unrighteously put on a tree. He was sinless. He was perfect. And he still went on the tree. He became a curse for us. So, anyway, that's a good point. Um, what's your parents? Uh, yep, over here. Look, imagine if we were to practice a lot of these uh, commandments here for children. I bet you there will be a, <laughs> a cleansing of the land, shall we <coughs> say, especially nowadays with the rebellion and the teenagers and everything we have today. They're so brainwashed and saturated in idolatry and sexual morality. I mean, we're literally living in like a Sodom and Gomorrah. And imagine if, imagine if this was a Torah observant country. You know, and we actually stoned drunkard children, drunkards and gluttons who just fill themselves and are so disrespectful and rebellious. That would make a whole lot of sense. <clears throat> I think that would be a great thing. And I know a lot of us, I don't know if it was David or Day Day, he was like, I wouldn't be alive if that was the case. <laughs> Sorry, bud. <laughs> yeah, maybe that is the case. But sorry, bud. I mean, you, you, you messed up your chance. If those commandments were, it's, you know, it's sad. But yeah, I probably wouldn't have been alive either. You, the fact that we don't live in, in under those laws, you know, that's mercy. Yeah. Or perhaps it would have just scared us all straight. I mean, at the same time, you know, we can't necessarily say. I mean, some people look at it and say, "Oh my goodness, it's so harsh." But at the same time, if this was actually the law of the land, if drunkenness wasn't okay, if drunkenness wasn't glorified, or sexual morality wasn't glorified, but actually shunned um, the way it used to be, I mean, you could just see over the past couple of decades the way things have, have changed, um, how things used to be shunned. I mean, from homosexuality to, to showing skin. I mean, women used to, they used to have these bathhouses, but women used to just actually physically when they're at the beach be in this little house this little hut be carried over to the water go into the water so no one can see them nowadays women are just walking around what I call a uh, waterproof penny and bras I mean so I, 
I mean, I I wish <laughs> and I I long for when we are in the New Yerushalayim where these the Torah is is obeyed with delight, um, and that I was just reading Proverbs this morning, and you know where the fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of of wisdom, and we would carry that through, you know. So. Very good point. Very good point. So we're going to end there, unless anybody wants to jump in and share any more. Brother David, we'll, we'll end there, take a break for now. Um, not sure how long the recording's been going, but I definitely feel like it's been at least an hour. It's 1.06. We started a little bit after 12, so it's about an hour, which is cool. But we can do another chapter. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to conclude there. That was uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21. Shalom. Mm-hmm.